Okay, so while people are coming in, we're going to let you know why are these two guys interviewing guys who know what they're talking about. Uh, we, we do a theology broadcast called Remnant Radio. Uh, it's on YouTube. We interview pastors and teachers from all over the world, uh, and we're unashamedly charismatic uh, in the expression of the gifts. We probably call ourselves continuationist, depending on what circle we're in, just because the term Pentecostal and term charismatic can occasionally have theological baggage to it. Um, so we teach on the gifts. We... Uh, we train on the gifts in local churches, um, but we, we do this stuff online every single Wednesday from 4 to 5. We do a show specifically on the charismatic gifts, the abuses, the, the you know, how to, how to practice these things, deliverance ministry, all that stuff we touch regularly. So if, if you're at a point where you're like, man, they're really touching on a lot of pastoral stuff, how to apply this, but I really want the theological guts of how the charismatic stuff works we have archives and archives with the guys on this panel um, talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how those actually flesh out. Um, so, Michael, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. And I'm Michael Rountree. I co-host with Josh uh, every week. So it's Wednesday, but we also do a Monday show, a Tuesday show. And we're really trying to, to dive into that word and spirit space where uh, we, we can speak with a... a uh, into the theological issues of the day, uh, but also really talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and answer all those kinds of questions. So I've uh, been in a uh, relationship with these guys. Uh, all of them have been on the show, Remnant Radio, at, at some point or another. But I think it would probably... you've taken half of their churches when they've retired. <laughs> What's that? You've taken half of their churches when they retired, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you make me sound like Absalom here. Like yeah, I that's just... not that's not. I heard a couple O's. Like inherited, <laughs> maybe is the right word. Uh, so, uh, so why don't we do just a, a quick introduction, and maybe maybe start on the far end with you, Jeff. Uh, just brief introduction to yourself and to your ministry, and then we're going to dive into a discussion about gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, okay, I'm Jeff Wells, the lead pastor here at Woods Edge. All right. Nailed it. Come on. I am Matt Chandler, pastor, lead pastor of the Village Church in Flower Mound for the last 18 years. My name's Jack Deere, and I'm not pastoring a church. <laughs> Congrats. You still get applause. <laughs> he was until Michael took it over. <laughs> it's true quit. That's and true, I'm Sam Storms, Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City for about 10 months until Michael takes it over. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you snooze, you lose, you know? <laughs> uh, okay, so, so in, this, in this session, we're going to try to craft our conversations around pastors because this is the whole point of the conference. We're not going to try to get into the weeds of a lot of the theology, but how do we really engage our churches, create a culture, prophecy, healing, deliverance? Those things are normative. Um, so I want to I start off asking a question about prophecy. Uh, because I think every pastor in the room is going to think, you know, if I open the door to prophecy, someone's going to get on stage and they're going to say something theologically wrong. And I'm going to have to clean that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sam, I think you used the illustration in your book. Someone got up and prophesied one time, uh, uh, you know, God is lonely. Okay. And then you had to get up and tell the whole room, okay, God's not lonely. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's a tinge of truth to this. So how do you, how do you pastor an audience in the midst of when a prophet, prophetic word goes off, it's wrong theologically, care for the audience, but also not shame the person who just took a risk. You want to start with Sam since well, it was well, your story? Why don't we start story? with Sam? What do, <laughs> tell, talk to us through what you did there. and then. Uh, yeah, it was actually a, a rather somewhat famous lady whose name I will not mention. I told Josh just before who it was and he laughed. But a uh, precious, precious lady. And um, after it was over, we didn't draw any, we didn't make any correction publicly at that time. We had a little break, so pulled her aside. And I, I, know what she, I know what she was intending to say. Namely, God wants a relationship with his people. He, hunger, he hungers for intimacy with us as we do with him. He delights in it. It glorifies him when we um, pursue him. And, and, of course, she put language to it that suggested that God is somehow needy and deficient. And, of course, Acts 17, Paul says, God doesn't need anything. He's made everything for his own glory. So I just lovingly said, have you thought about the implications of what you said? And is that consistent with what we see in Scripture? And I think I know what you meant. She said, yeah, that's what I meant. So 
when we came back out, she corrected herself. She said, I, I, miss, I misspoke. Um, here's what I intended, but it was good that a correction was brought. She was very humble. Now, not everybody is. Sometimes they'll get real defiant, get their back up, and who are you to say that? And then they'll get real defensive about, well, I was, I was right in the first place. Sometimes there's not much you can do about those people. But in this case, you know, behind the scenes, without bringing shame or humiliation on this individual, we brought the correction, and she responded beautifully. So what you're saying is you, you didn't take her out back and, like, stone her. You didn't excommunicate her. So I, I love that uh, just the way you, you showed grace in this situation because I think that when we talk about prophecy, oftentimes it's just, it is a, I mean, no one ever actually says stone the false prophet, but the label false prophet is pretty easily thrown out there. And, um, and Jack, I'd, I'd like to just address you as, uh, as one who's also, while you're not currently leading a church has led a church into maturity in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what would you say to pastors and leaders to put them at ease? Because some of them are thinking, why not just not have that kind of mess to even have to correct? If somebody's going to, if I'm going to put a, a prophet or a prophetess up on the stage and they're going to speak for God something that might be wrong, that just sounds like a big fat mess. So Jack, put us at ease. <laughs> yeah, you got to get comfortable with messes. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, Ephesians 4, God raised up uh, pastors and teachers to train people to do the work of the ministry. People in the church are supposed to be doing the work of the ministry. And I don't know, I see a statistic all the time, but 50% of the pastors in America would resign if they could make a living at something else. And I think the reason is they're trying to do something they're not called to do, which is all the ministry in the in the church, we're called to be trainers and equippers. So that, that, that's the first thing, and that means we're going to have to put up with some messes. Uh, it, and we, we're not above making messes ourselves. I've made plenty of those as a leader of a church, and we just teach people to be comfortable with that. And the, the second thing is never, ever use the Sunday morning service as a training time. I would never come, I would never, uh, uh, we did this in Anaheim, and I think it was a huge mistake. We would have maybe 3,000 people in the room, and we would have a two to five minute program pause after the worship, and anybody who wanted to give a prophetic word could stand up and shout out a prophetic word to thousands of people. Who, and none of the people that got up had authority to speak to thousands of people. And, we, and I heard some of the most ridiculous things. I heard famine is coming, revival is coming was a common one, and none of those things ever came true, and the people endured it because it only lasted two to five minutes. What, what we were actually doing is teaching people how to despise prophecy. Uh, it, it's just irrelevant. It doesn't have anything to do with your life. So the, we would not come to church on Sunday morning and say, okay, who'd like to give the Sunday morning sermon? Why? Because we have a certain level of expectation of the giftedness and the authority of one who's going to bring that message and speak to the whole church. Why not have the same standard for somebody who's going to speak prophetically to the whole church? So use home groups, special training times and all that to train uh, prophetic people. And then, and then there are a number of different ways to do this on Sunday morning. But only the most gifted people that you actually trust to address the whole body uh, let, let them do it, and, uh, and, and don't make the whole service prophetic, but, uh, and you don't have to do it every time, but find a way that works for you with uh, well-trained prophets who have your, a, a gifting and a character that you, you trust to put on a Sunday stage. Okay, uh, this question's going to be for, for Matt and for Jeff. You guys pastor larger churches, and with that comes a kind of you know, I could change the paint and lose three people yeah. um, in, in a church of that size. And I think every pastor in here goes, I'm going to make some kind of transition in the gifts. I think that's why they're here. They're going, I want to do this more. There are going to be people I'm going to lose along the way. Yeah. Now, I've been around the village. I've seen how you've been so patient with, with, with congregants, with staff, with all of those things. How have you navigated that space with wisdom Trying, trying to think of their best interest. Obviously, you're going to lose some folk. Yeah. It's going to happen. But you've done it in a way that's been gentle and caring. How do you do that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I know how to answer the question. I know that I actually deeply love the men and women of the Village Church. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have endured much together over 18 years. Um, and so I, I want to lose them with clarity, not with what they're afraid of. Mm. And so what, I was, what I've been trying to do since 2017 is create spaces where I can teach a little bit, watch God show off. Sometimes God would force my hand, right? He would do something. I was like, oh, I guess that's where we are, so let me teach on that. Um, and then I would do what I do every Sunday morning was let's walk by this line, let's walk through this line by line and, and then just go, this is what the word of God says. If we're going to be serious about this, we have to be serious about this. And I meant at that point, if we're going to be serious about the word of God, we have to be serious about this. Um, and so it was a, and, and still is in a very real way, a multifaceted approach where if you do start in smaller rooms, then one of the things you're going to see is, is you're going to find out what the red flags are. And what I've found is the red flags are almost always the same mm -hmm. um, across churches. People's concerns are the same really across churches. Uh, you will have people in your church that left really terrible charismatic settings and they think you're trying to take them there. Mm -hmm. And so you need to address that early on. Uh, you, you've got people that have been trained. They've been discipled their whole life that all of this is nonsense and they've got a lot of television channels and stories and YouTube videos yep. that confirm, right? They're, they're not hit pieces. They confirm. I, I was about to use an example, and I'm not going to. The, and, and so you're navigating a space. I was navigating a space where here's what I know. Primarily, the men and women of the Village Church, they love the Word of God. They love Jesus Christ, and they're really serious about seeing lost people come to know him and follow him. I love those three things about him. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to lead in a way that I owned it. I didn't put it on them. That I had failed to teach them, not that they had failed in some way. Um, and then I the earnestness at which I was asking the spirit to lead and guide and still like, are we ready for what please? And I'm still like, here's the, here was the dream. It, it's funny cause it, it actually happened and it didn't matter, but like would the Lord show off in a kind of way that just everybody was like, sheesh, that's, that's legit. You know, that, that's what you want, right? Just like some, like an arm to grow back or something. Who's going to complain about that? You know who? Some people in your church. <laughs> that's true. So we were, I was just true. telling the story. I, I love that my wife and Candace and I've got members that are here at, at an encounter. I, I felt like the Lord wanted to heal. It was a simultaneous shoulder and hip. And um, the, this guy, not a, not a Christian, Friends dropped him off just back from Iraq, really in a tough spot. Depression, dark, and he had been shot um, through his hip, and it was with an automatic weapon as he rolled around with his shoulder. So it, it popped both of them. He hadn't been able to lift weights. He hadn't been able to. And, and so he was freaked out that I just said, it's a, it's a hip and a shoulder. It's recent. Um, you, you've been stuck. You haven't been able to work out. You so he comes forward, and he, he happens to come to Landon Carl, one of our elders, who's a former army guy, and did a couple tours in Iraq. Well, Landon doesn't want to address the hip and shoulder. He wants to share the gospel with him. So Landon shares the gospel with him and then brings him over to me, and he's just like a mess. I mean, like, like a ghost. So we pray for him, and he says some words out loud that I won't say in here, and God just healed him, like right there, just healed him completely. And then he broke and asked Jesus to save him. And so we just like literally watch the book of Acts play out right there. Just like literally, it's just like you read this, man. You, you want this. And man, there were a couple of really key people in the church like, that was really strange. <laughs> so then I, I wanted to, there is a point where, you've said it so well, Josh, you will not keep everyone. And, and I think the, the pain in it is, if we're honest, there's some people that can leave our church and that's actually, we're grateful for that. That's that blessed subtraction. You know, you're just like, thank you for hearing my prayers. And, and then there are people that you, you baptize them. You, you visit them in the hospital. You, you wept with them over their wayward child. And, and now you don't preach the gospel anymore because you're into this. Um, and that stuff hurts. But you have to, for me, it was a, 
I want to make sure I'm hearing from the Spirit. I want to be really gentle. I'm a bit of a, my wife says I don't have one to four. I just have five to ten. And, and so I need to be gentle here, compassionate at backgrounds that are very real, with very real hurt, and, and try to lead with that knowledge. And that's how I've tried to do it. Slow, intentional, small, so that when things bubble up, I can get in there and pastorally address them. Um, wanted to make sure my, my staff was all on the same page. Yeah. We want something to happen and some dude that's on staff to counsel them the exact other. Yeah, I don't know what's, what Chandler's doing right now. So did a lot of work with staff. So, so that's how we've done it. Amen. Jeff? Can, can I follow up on that same question? Or do you have, or, or Jeff? I, I was going to do the same thing. Yeah, go ahead. But actually, I'm, I might pause and just make one comment. And uh, Because, Matt, when I hear you talking, uh, you, you talk about clarity leading with humility, <laughs> creating spaces, and, and while well, you didn't use this word, but the, the boldness to actually continue to step forward, yeah. these are really all principles of just general leadership. Yeah. So for pastors and leaders who are here, and we talk, we talk about moving into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, yes, it's important that we begin to, to understand just how the gifts of the Holy Spirit work, but, but it is general principles of leadership that you've applied in other areas of your church right. just That's applied good. into this area. Yeah. So don't be a jerk when counseling and don't be a jerk when doing the gifts. There you go. That's true. Solid. I could have just said that. So, <laughs> so Jeff, same, same question to you. Talk to us about uh, how you've, I've heard you say that you, uh, that you've been a functional, although not a technical cessationist, but a functional cessationist. You've begun moving your church. Talk to us about your leadership and moving forward in that. All right. Uh, just a, a preface comment. Um, I have really been excited about this week and hopeful and prayerful that God would use it uh, in a great way. So I'm just so excited to get here Monday morning. We had a fabulous night, Sunday night with Jack, kind of a pre-conference uh, uh, day, really, Saturday morning, Saturday night. And I'm so excited about what God's doing and what God's going to do and open up letter without a return and address early that morning and somebody in the church uh out of here and so a little dose of reality yep. that everybody's not going to love it and um do you feel guilty about that <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm, I'm sure sh should we get him to feel guilty? i'm sure they weren't there sunday night jack so uh, it, it was just the idea of what we're doing so just a reminder and, and like Matt, I've been at our church forever. You know, I started the church 28 years ago. And so I've got a lot of chips here, but not enough yeah. to keep everybody uh, here. You know, a few thoughts. One, one is that uh, a great group of elders who are right with me, lockstep with me on all of this. And uh, we, we have never been a cessationist church in, in theology, though practically a lot we have. I think it helped us that in some ways we have kind of had a two-step process. In 2002, um, we, we became very intentionally focused on prayer, a church of prayer. And, and it was a good segue. We just were too late in taking the rest of the, the steps. But um, I, read, I had read Jack's book, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, and that was such a big book in my life. And then I influenced by Jim Cimbala mm -hmm. to move into prayer. And we began a, a, a prayer service on Wednesday night in August of 2002, and we've done it ever since. And the first, and, and, and we've always prayed for healing. So, sometimes we pray the whole time for healing and, and the whole service, but other times it's parts of it. We always pray for healing. And, and the first semester that we began doing this, the first few months, we had two dramatic healings. And I think that was encouragement to all of us. Oh, yes, God does heal and in remarkable ways. Uh, but, but in some ways, we did not complete the movement, the natural movement. I haven't done really anything hardly with prophecy. At times, I would read a prophetic word on a Wednesday night. Somebody would give me a sheet of paper, and I'd read it and make sure it was good. And, but hardly anything. And, and haven't just really pursued the gifts like we should have. I, I felt freshly convicted, Matt, by your challenge this morning that uh, no, we have somewhat believed in all the gifts and practiced some of them, 
uh, it, it wasn't. Uh, I, Jack came to our church a year ago, and I knew Jack a little bit at seminary, and I loved his book. I just and I read all of his books and, and loved them. And I, and I don't know why I didn't bring Jack in, you know, twenty years ago. I, I don't know even to this day. Jack was very gracious with me. I confessed that to him, and. Just, um, but we, we are late in pursuing the gifts as we are told to in 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to pursue the higher gifts, pursue the, the gifts, especially the gift of prophecy and to really be normal biblical Christianity as you were describing it, Matt, this morning, just a biblical church. And so, you know, this has been so helpful for us. You know, I feel like God, during a remnant radio show in May when Jack was here, put it on my heart at that point. You know, there are a lot of pastors like me who believe in all the gifts but aren't doing much. So let's just host a gathering. Uh, I'd been trying to get to Convergence for a while, but because of COVID, they weren't hosting it. So we did. But, you know, this is more for me than anybody. I'm here as a learner. To uh, that we, okay, what, what's next for us? And you know, I want to be uh, wise and gentle, and my, my wife is, uh, is a good help for me to do this, don't do that, uh, more of this, and uh, some other people around me. So we're just, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm completely con- convinced it's all biblical, so we're going to head this way. And um, Trust that God's going to guide us. Jack, um, training and prophecy. Because we're about to talk about, like, hey, how do, we, how do we start training? But before we do that, we have to address the, the elephant in the room of the, the kind of trope of, like, you actually can't train in prophecy. Like, there's, there's no Bible verse that says this is how you train prophecy. So how, how do you, That's in the back of someone's mind because before we do that, right, we've got to address those, those elephants. So how, how can you put the minds at ease to the, the pastors and teachers here that it's an okay thing to teach prophecy? It's an yeah. okay thing to teach healing and deliverance. I'm not sure there's a verse that says train in evangelism, is there? Nobody yeah. is against it. Well, I don't think anybody's against it. He's like going through his, his, his Rolodex of scripture right now. He's like, nope, it's not there. <laughs> Sam, Sam's like, wait, no, I corrected the ESV once. I'm pretty sure I fixed it. it yeah, what's the real version say, Sam? It wasn't in the first edition, but it was in the uh. second I'm going to have I'm going to have to clarify that before we're, before this week is I love over, you. all right? I love that. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, I think Jesus is is the model. Uh, the only one who never needed any help chose 12 helpers. Why? To teach them or train them to love what he loves and 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 actually to love them. And so that that's what we're doing with with all the spiritual gifts with teaching of evangelism is somebody has to take you by the hand and show you how to do this or you'll make a mess out of it. So uh, Jesus is our model. I mean, he he taught the disciples how to do everything. He did it in front of them and then released them to do it. He taught them how to heal by by healing in in front of them. So we do the same thing in in church. But it all begins, prophecy all begins with hearing the voice of God. So I was one of those guys as a seminary professor that says God doesn't speak except in this book. And why would you trust dreams or impressions? You might have a one-off dream that's from God. Okay, fine. But don't, don't, think, don't expect that's going to be uh, normal. And, and so somebody has to come along and say, look, it, it, 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, earnestly pursue spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is not inspired teaching. It's revealing the future. And, uh, and it all starts with teaching someone how to tell this impression is from God um, or this dream is from God. Uh, and then the, the, everybody can hear God. The prophetic people are going to be consistent at hearing God for other people. Uh, and then home groups are, I think, are the best place to learn to do that because every week you can, you can have a practice in a home group at hearing God. And after a while in the home group, you'll see, hey, that person's really good at healing. That person's got a gift of mercy. Uh, this person has got a prophetic gift. And then, so we'll have a, then we'll move with special training for the prophetically gifted people and show them etiquette, and, and when they get really good enough, then you figure out a way to use them on a Sunday morning uh, service. And there's no one right way to do this. It's, it's totally up to you. 
and your church and the leading of God. He'll show you how to do it for your church uh, in a way that doesn't burn the church down. Michael, how do you do prophecy at your church? How do we do prophecy at our church? How do we practice it or train it? Train for it or both? Practice, practice it. Well, we have uh, a number of different spaces in which we do so, and you talked about spaces, but um, we have prophetic teams that pray for people at the end of every service. Uh, we also will prophesy from the stage. Now, the people who prophesy from the stage are those who are most proficient in the gift of prophecy, and this is what Jack trained us in, was uh, that Sunday morning is for, and, and I can't remember, you might have mentioned that just a few minutes ago, but Sunday morning is for the mature expression of the gifts, and so, uh, and so our most gifted prophetic people will prophesy from the stage, and we, we kind of set that up and pastor that moment. Uh, and then prophecy has been flowing for so long in our church, and it, we, we just, we encourage it, and, and all of our small groups practice prophecy. If you come to a small group, good chance you might get prophesied over. If you just come to church, you might get prophesied over, uh, because it's, it's become a part of the culture, and, uh, and it's spread like that. So really, in any setting where the people of God gather, there's a good chance you might get prophesied over, but there are specific spaces that we mobilize for it. We also send people out in evangelism, and, uh, and they do uh, what some would call power evangelism, and John Wimber wrote a book about power evangelism, a really good book about it, but where they move in prophetic and healing and deliverance, just as Jack talked about the Jesus sending out the disciples to, to preach and demonstrate the gospel. And it is a lot easier to preach the gospel after you have demonstrated the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in all of those ways. Sam, how do you guys do it at Bridgeway? Because you, well, your model is super cool to me. With the, with, like you said, I like got 30 people that you've trained up in yeah. the I, I want to just follow up on something that Jack said as well. Um, have you ever noticed how we treat the so-called miraculous gifts of the Spirit altogether different from how all other gifts are treated? Now, again, all gifts are miraculous because they're all manifestations right. of the Spirit. So I don't really like that language, but people use it. Um, when I was in seminary, when Jack was in the seminary, we, we took classes in homiletics. It's a fancy word for how to preach. So preaching and teaching is a spiritual gift. So why did they give us a class? To train us. Um, I don't know that people are born administrators. You learn administrative skills. That's a spiritual gift, administration, leadership. Every spiritual gift can be taught and honed and trained and improved upon. Um, and if you don't, so why do we think that, oh, only those can, but prophecy and praying for the sick can't? Um, you're all supposed to pray for the sick, but some people do it really badly. And yet others, you know, they learn, they, they know what to say, what not to say, how to treat people if, if nothing happens. Um, all these things you can grow, you can learn, you can improve. So I don't know why we differentiate um, among these gifts as if some can be taught and trained and improved upon, but others cannot. I just think it's, yeah. Okay, now back to your question. Um, uh, we, st we started out, um, I, I created a prophetic leadership team and handpicked about, I think we had oh, eight or nine individuals, four or five men, four or five women, and they meet regularly once a month on Sunday mornings. Uh, they process perhaps prophetic words that people have in the church. Maybe somebody in the church has a dream. Somebody had a, a powerful encounter. We tell them, submit it to the prophetic leadership team. They process it. They pray about it. They interact with that person. Then they may come to me and the elders and say, you know, we think this is something for the whole body. Um, then we had about 30 individuals that we have actually authorized. Uh, Jack was talking about on a Sunday morning, you, you don't have an open microphone. You don't let people stamp popcorn prophecies all over the place, popping up and yelling out things. That's really dangerous. Um, I, I told these guys, we had a guy come to our church. I don't know if he's watching this or eventually will. Sunday, two days ago, first time at Bridgeway, came up to me afterwards, and I'm so glad we didn't have an open mic because he came up and said, uh, by the way, have you read the, the four new books of the Bible? <laughs> he said, uh, help me. He said, yeah, we got there are four, four books of the Bible. Uh, they're not 66 in the can, they're 70. And he began to describe these for me. And I thought, can you imagine if he'd have come to the platform or had an open microphone and spouted something so stupid? Start prophesying over people. What? They start prophesying over people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 
So we start out with about 30, and these individuals, they used to have to come to me to process their word, but I now have such confidence in them. I know who they are. I know their maturity. They know what is and is not permissible. Um, they don't have to vet their word through me before they share it. We now have expanded that list to about 100 because we're constantly doing prophetic. We have two weeks ago, we had a prophetic training on a Saturday morning for three hours. We had 15 people drive down from Wisconsin for it. It was great. Uh, three from Iowa, um, just because they're so hungry to learn. By the way, you all are welcome to come. Anybody can come whenever we have these. So we have, and, and now I have a master email list of all the people that we are, are recognized. You've actually, whether or not you have, whether you're a prophet or whether you've actually done it well. And so every week or so, I'll send out an email of instruction, correction. Hey, let's let, let, let's consider this, or how do we process what happened last week, or I might issue, like I'm getting ready to send out a, an email that's going to really make some people mad at me, because there's a particular lady who's all over the internet, and she's l truly deranged. Uh, you all even did an episode about her, so, but I got a lot of people following her, and they're just imbibing all this utter, absolute nonsense. Are you going to mention her name in that email? Oh, Yeah. Why don't you mention the name now? Yeah. Yeah. Go <laughs> Sam. We can do it. Her, her name sounds, it's Kat Kerr is who it is. Her name is Kat. You're going to do a sounds I'll do like. It. it sounds like. <laughs> it's not the I, right Kat I hope and pray this woman knows Jesus. Yeah. I really do. And I'm not saying she's not a born again believer. But if you're following her stuff, stop it. It is seriously deluded beyond anything I have ever heard being spouted in the body of Christ. So, and this we? is not a new problem, right? You had false prophets in the first exactly. century running around. And absolutely. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's absolute absurdity. Like, it's not, it's not like, hey, Trump is, you know, president, you know, six months, eight months later. It's like, you know, there's mailboxes made of jello we can eat in heaven and cows that drive kids to prophetic art classes. I wearing, mean, wearing overalls. Ab absolute, cows, cows wearing overalls. Absolutely. Talking absurdity. to the kids. You can yeah. ride bucking broncos in heaven and the horses will talk to you and then you can dive into the crystal sea with them and you don't have to worry about breathing because you can all breathe underwater. I mean, it's, it's like she claims to have been to heaven thousands of times, not once like Paul, thousands of times. I don't believe that. I just simply don't believe that. And, I, and we'll probably lose some people from our church because they, they're, they're enamored with it and it's sometimes you have to bring strong correction for the sake of the souls of people. Right. So yeah. it's, it's not easy. Uh, I don't, boy, I hope I don't regret it. I've got a question on the back up. end of that, but I'll, I'll circle back around to you. Okay. Uh, I want to give Matt another chance to, to talk here. So maybe you could talk us through, because I, I know that in your context, you have a lot of people who are concerned about that kind of oh, thing. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Hey, you, you know, Chandler, you open it up to spiritual gifts, you're going to get traveling to heaven three days later. And, and look, Sam's opened his church up to spiritual gifts and people, you know, and so he's having to correct this. And so, um, so talk, talk into that. How are you shepherding the fact that you, you want to keep going for it? Yeah. But you have a real concern for error, yeah. and, and so how do you navigate that space? So what I've tried to do up until this point is I, I don't really name the person or um, the church, but I will certainly say we don't believe this. We believe this. And so I'll try to draw a distinction between what we want to see God do and what we believe the Bible lays before us and where this idea has kind of gone off the rails in, in, in this way. So uh, like if I, when I'm teaching on healing, uh, I want to point out there are people that believe that if everyone around you just has enough faith for you and if you just have enough faith yourself, you'll be healed. I think that's cruel. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's cruel to you as a sick person I think it's cruel to put all of that on the people everywhere. It, it breaks relationships. It's evil. It's not true. This is what is true. And then I want to muddy the waters just a little bit by saying, and yet there is some aspect of faith at play here. So what we want to do is, and, and men, if I'm ever praying for the sick with a group of people, I'll always 
start with, um, let, let's just confess us who are going to pray. Let's just confess any doubt we might have right now that the Spirit of God might to the Lord. We don't want to do it out loud. Let's just say, Lord, I want to believe more than I do that in this moment, this person with stage four cancer that the doctors have sent home to die can be restored right before my very eyes. I, I want you to drive out of me right now, Holy Spirit, any doubt that that might be possible. And, and I don't know that I've ever like <laughs> physically felt that doubt being driven out, but I do want to say to the Lord, I know you can do this. I don't like this thing in me that's thinking that you can't. I want to bring that into submission to you. So give a couple of minutes and then we pray. So, so I want to go, this is where, where it's wrong, I want to say it's wrong. Where it's evil, I want to say it's evil. Uh, and then I want to go, Here, here's the biblical sweet spot. This is what we're aiming at. And, and so that's how I've, I've tried to do it at the village. I mean, that was kind of the question that I was just going to follow up with, with any of you guys, honestly. Um, I, I think that there is this desire in the charismatic community, like, we want to go after the gifts. We want to see prophecy. We want to see healing. And we, we really want to go after it. But if we police our own movement, yeah. if we step out of line and say, hey, that's too far, then we're going to quench the work of the Spirit. Yeah. And I find that there's this massive group of people that, are, that have been hurt and been abused in these really, I don't want to say hyper-charismatic as if that's a kind of pejorative way, but these really out-of-control spaces. And I find that those people, like, that's a guy I can trust. Yeah. When we get together and we say, hey, here and no further, <laughs> this, is, this is wackadoodle space, um, that we actually, we actually create a sense of reliability and trust in the body of Christ. Um, Sam, you've, you've written tons of articles on that. Have you found that your, your church trusts you more that you're willing to speak out on those things? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> that seems to be the case. Uh, I, still, I still make some people mad. You know, I, I, I want to say this as well. Um, you know, Matt touched on uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21. Um, do not quench the spirit. And he specifically means by despising prophetic utterances. Yeah. And of course, the, re the remedy to that isn't gullibility. Oh, gosh, I got to embrace, I got to swallow up naively everything that is said in the name of prophecy. No, test everything, weigh it, evaluate it, hold what is good, reject what isn't. And the amazing thing about this that we don't often think about, the church to whom Paul sent that instruction, it's one of the most mature churches yeah. that he founded. You read the first few verses of 1 Thessalonians 1. He's praising them for their maturity, their growth, their love. You receive the word of God, not as a word from man, but as from God himself. And yet there were people in Thessalonica who were despising prophecies. Mm. Why? For the same reason you and I do. Yeah. There were goofy people yeah. trying to control lives, yeah. predicting things that didn't come to pass, manipulating others, using supposed prophetic words to advance their cause and ambition in the church to get more power, to look import, all the same reasons you and I go, ugh. And Paul says, I, I realize that happens. If you despise prophecies, you're sinning. Yeah. The violation of an apostolic command is a sin. That's, right. That's what you touched on. Right. And so again, but that didn't mean you have to swallow everything that comes along under the name of the prophetic. Test it, evaluate it, examine it in the light of Scripture. Uh, pray over it with somebody who may have delivered a word and you question it um, because otherwise you're, you're pouring water on the Spirit's fire and you don't want to do that. I'd also say the, the thing that was surpri most surprising to me is I, I think in all of our churches there's that, I, in fact I'm almost ready to say in every church everywhere, maybe even out in California in a certain spot, there's a group of charismatic people that are just praying and hoping that it breaks loose in that congregation. Um, and, and I have a couple of times now found them to be some of the most difficult as we've made this journey in regards to, um, well, one, the speed at which they want it, and then two, that oftentimes they, they want it to go a lot further than it's going to go at our place. And it's some of what you're talking about where Maybe they've got an overrealized eschatology, or they they're the first to. I mean, once your congregation's like, oh, this way, they'll start handing out books that you don't want. You don't want your congregation reading those books, yeah. and so I spent just as much time on that side of things than I did on those that were nervous that we were going to become Bethel. Yeah. That's good, and 
And Jeff, one of the things that uh, that you, a couple of things you've talked about is you, you talked about how you felt like at first you were too slow to move into the gifts. Why didn't I have Jack come earlier was yeah. one of the things that you said. But you also said, hey, I'm just learning here like yeah. everybody else. Yeah. And I, I'd like for you to, to ask maybe what would you say to the pastors and Christian leaders who are here at this conference who... Are, are hearing these guys unpack, unpack some of the finer theological points on prophecy and healing and over-realized eschatology and all of these things, that there can be this feeling that in order to move forward, I need to be an expert. In order to move forward, I need to learn everything about this, and then maybe in 10 or 20 years, I can take a baby step. <laughs> so, I, I, so you felt like you went too slow. Yeah. What would be your encouragement to those who are in process of learning, don't feel expert enough and would like to move their, gifts, their churches forward? Well, a couple of thoughts. One, come to a conference like this, so they've already done that, so way to go. A uh, second thought is um, you've got to take seriously, you know, those passages that say pursue, earnestly pursue the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And, and uh, just the biblical teaching, just... We just got to do that. We've got to, our people need it. And I, I just, I think about the hurting, the, just the people who need physical healing in our church. And when somebody gets healed, just the difference it makes. I mean, it's just an incredible act of love to pray for healing. Yeah. And when you see people healed, it's just, ah, oh, just as shepherds, we've got to unleash all the healing God wants to unleash. Yeah. And same for prophetic words of encouragement. I mean, what... Uh, Michael Miller, Aaron, if I could just use you as an example, when he began speaking to you back in the booth, you know, it's exactly where, where you are. And I, I could only guess, Aaron, that that is really encouraging to you, that God knows. <laughs> yeah. God knows. And so we, we just, you know, I just don't, don't want to get to heaven and have the Woods Edge family miss out on anything that God wants. So I think just recognizing that it's, it's really <coughs> a, a loving thing to yeah. try to have a biblical. So per, I, hear, I hear Sam and Jack talking about home groups a lot. Like that's the place to get started. So you got a pastor. He's going to go home. Uh, they're going to sit down with their staff, and they're going to they're have three home groups they're going to start in the next three weeks. Okay, what do they do? Like what's just sit around and say God speak, and then like they don't hear anything audibly. So if they just sit there for a really long time, like what's the how do you do that? Yeah. You asking me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, my mentor was John Wimber. Nobody knows who he is today, but back in the uh, 80s and 90s, he was the most loved and hated pastor in America. And he was hated by conservative evangelicals because he was so good at leading people into the gifts of the Spirit, conservative uh, evangelicals. And uh, so I asked him, uh, how, how do you, how, his church was amazing. I mean, so many people could do prophetic ministry, healing, uh, Every week, somebody got healed in his church. And, and so I say, how do you t teach? I mean, how do, where do they learn to do this? And he says, well, it's in our home groups. And he, he, said, we, we, uh, every, he said, if you're not in a home group, I do not consider you a member of my church. He said, we got 5,000 people coming here. 2,500 people are doing ministry. That's my church, those 2,500. And they're all in home groups, and that's where they learn how to do ministry. So a typical home group would, would uh, start with... Uh, you know, maybe some singing or worship, and then we would just stop and say, let's, uh, let's ask the Lord if there's anybody here he wants to touch or give a message to or pray for. And so 15, 20 people all bow our heads, and, uh, and then if you've got an impression, you, you give it, and that's where you learn. You fail. Oh, and the other big thing uh, Wimber said that the home groups teach is if you're not willing to fail, you will never never move in any gift of the Spirit. You have to be willing to fail. Every good athlete is a, is a bad athlete who didn't give up. Yep. And, and, and so he created this environment that was conducive to failure. We just make jokes about our failure and, and uh, all that. So I never had a word of knowledge, but I saw him do the most amazing stuff. Uh, I mean, we at a conference and, and uh, 3,500 people in the room. He's walking off the stage and he comes back up. He goes, oh, there's a lady here that has cancer, would you please come down and we'll, we'll pray for you. And the ministry team was already praying for people. No lady came down. He said, uh, he stopped for a minute, and uh, he said, you flew in on Tuesday, and you came here specifically 
to be uh, prayed for for cancer. Would you please come down? No lady comes down. And he just says, um, you're wearing a pink dress and you're sitting in the back of the room. Would you please come down? The lady in the very back row, pink dress, gets up and walks down to the front. And, and I'm just, uh, I mean, it's like Elijah and Elisha are back, you know. And I, I, I'd say, I, I go, man, that must have gone off like a foghorn in your mind. And he goes, oh, no, Jack, just the opposite. It was so subtle. If I hadn't been paying attention, I would have missed it. I thought we were through and the ministry team was just going to pray for bone and joint problems. And I was walking off the stage. And I just had an impression about this lady not coming down that had cancer. And I walked back up on the stage, and I said, just an impression? He goes, yeah, yeah, just a, he said, it was so slight, I almost missed it. And I go, flew in on Tuesday, and he said, well, when she didn't come down, Tuesday floated through my mind, and a lot of people come, the conferences start on Thursday, a lot of people come on Tuesday to uh, see beautiful Southern California, and I thought that must have meant she flew in, I go, pink dress sitting in the back. He said, when she didn't come forward, uh, I just saw for a couple of seconds pink floating over the... Uh, back of the room, and I thought that must mean she's wearing a pink dress and sitting in the back <laughs> row. <laughs> and I went, John, you just called out that woman in front of 3,500 people based on those flimsy impressions? He goes, Yeah, do it all the time. <laughs> I, go, wow. I go, Why? And he says, That's just the way the Lord speaks to me, and I've had better success getting, uh, learning how to hear the way he speaks than getting him to speak the way I want him to. So that was, that was like my first example of pay attention to these faint impressions. So and he tells me, well, this is what they learned to do in, their, in the home groups. And I, and I never had a word of knowledge. And I said, John, do you think if I went back to my church and, and got a home group, do you think that God would speak to me? He goes, I don't know why he wouldn't. So based on that Great prophetic word. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I went back. The Lord. I went back to my cessationist church. I'm still a professor at Dallas Seminary, and uh, and I I get a home group of 15 to 20 people, and I say, okay, now we're gonna just wait and watch for wait for an impression that comes in or some kind of sensation in your uh, uh, body, and uh, and and God's gonna speak to us and He'll show us people to pray for. So I just tell them that totally confident without ever having heard God myself, uh, <laughs> and that he will heal somebody that night. That's how we started. Um, and, he did, and he did. He spoke to some people. Some people were wrong. Some people were right. Some people got healed that night, and that was just the start. And uh, that, was our, that became the best part of church. And to me, a home group is still the best part of church. I love being in a home group, and, and I always uh, have one. Wow. Can I tag on to that? Some of you may have just heard Jack describe how John Wimber was getting words of knowledge, and you think, that is so freaky. Where's that in the Bible? Well, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul's talking about a, a prophetic ministry in the corporate gathering, and he says, and if a revelation comes to one who is sitting, you say, how, how does that happen? Paul doesn't define it. He doesn't say, oh, you have to have a feeling, you have to see a picture, you have to get an impression. It's just the Spirit disclosing something. I think God deliberately didn't define specifically how that happens because there is a multitude of different ways in which God can speak. You remember when Paul in Acts, he said he saw that a man had faith to be healed. And I've wondered, does that mean saw in the sense I perceived? How did he perceive it? Did he actually see something? You've had that experience. You know, maybe something across the face of this guy that indicated he had faith to be healed. Um, Maybe he what? saw a puke emoji. <laughs> Michael that's prophesied a, a puke a, emoji over Cole. He did get healed, though. <laughs> all right. That's right. a reference to Sunday night. Sorry. You weren't here I, for that. I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, I don't even mind mentioning her name. Uh, some of you may know the name of David Roos, R-U-I-S. He was a great worship leader in the vineyards now in Canada. He was my next-door neighbor in Kansas City. He was the worship leader at the, the, the home of the Kansas City Prophets. And I'd never met David. I didn't know him. I never, certainly never met his wife. So my first time in Kansas City, I'm taken into a room. Phil Elston was in the room. I, I got to shut this. Phil, I, I didn't know Phil from Adam's Orphan. He didn't know me. And he's, he's sitting in the corner of the room. He looks at me. He said, your father is not living. Well, you know, he gets a 50-50 shot there. <laughs> and he was right. And he said, 
you had the most unusual relationship with your earthly dad. And he began to describe it. I just broke weeping. And then this lady, she's over here, and she's looking at me real strange. And it was Anita Roos, I found out later. And she's, and she's, she gets pictures of hats. Weird. And the hat tells something about the individual. And she's, she's looking at me, and she said, I just saw... It's kind of the time of the medieval Reformation period. The scholars would wear these strange-looking hats, a scholar's hat, and I see you just surrounded by books, and you love to read and write. And I thought, that's weird. But isn't it great God can do that? I mean, there, whether it's color. We have a, a lady in our church who um, she gets impressions from movies. She had an impression the other night about the movie Mannequin that came out years ago. I never saw it. And that, that there, there was going to be somebody in church Sunday morning who feels like a mannequin. They're plastic, they're artificial, they're dead inside, they've been crying. Out. And you wouldn't believe the kind of ministry that happened as a result of that. So don't, don't freak out when people say, I saw a pink color just float across the back of the room. God can do, he's creative, he's artistic, he's poetic. And he loves to surprise us. Now, that doesn't mean that every weird thought and image you get is from him. But he, he, he doesn't define specifically how revelation comes. Just said it comes. Okay. Josh feels as though we should unpack the puke emoji. I just want to say that, like, <laughs> you know who doesn't think the puke emoji is weird? Like Cole who got healed. Yeah, okay. So what he's referring to was on Sunday night, I, I had a prophetic word from the stage for Cole. Where are you at, Cole? There he is. He's real. There's Cole. And, um, and I, I saw an image of an emoji that was a puke emoji. And, and I had a oh, sense. Oh, wait. A what? An emoji. So, you know those little faces? Do you, never, you, use, do you never use the puke emoji? I'm, I you don't need, use emojis at all. You so. need to add emojis I'm gonna hook you up, to your Sam. arsenal. There's gonna, a puke in uh, P-U-K-E yes. emoji. I'm going to help you put it in your next I kept, email. I thought you were saying pink emoji. I could, no, no, puke. No. Puke. There, this is vomit. It's green oh. vomit coming out of the yellow I'm face. I'm going to text it to you. <laughs> Hit him right now. Matt's going to text it. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing it now. He's doing it. I wish we could blow that up on the big screen. So, but I asked, I asked the Lord about it. I mean, random pictures can flit across your mind at any time. I asked the Lord, is this you? There you go, Sam. You just did. I saw it. It's right there. And I asked the Lord, is this you? And I felt like he said, said yes. Oh, so, let me see it. It is That's, so graphic. So uh, happening up here. <laughs> when, when someone texts something oh, to you that you yeah, really detest, that's when you send the puke emoji. Okay. So, <laughs> I can help you put it in your next email if you want. <laughs> <laughs> to the prophetic teams. <laughs> can I finish the story? Okay. So it actually started, I, and I was just kind of processing it with the Lord when Michael Miller had a word about indigestion, but it was more general and then I pointed it, and Cole was wearing a white shirt. You in the white shirt, I felt like you specifically had indigestion that you threw up uh, just the other night, I think is what I said. And you started nodding your head real big like that. And so uh, Cole came up to me after the service today. He said, man, I've been... So first of all, Cole had not... Uh, he'd been having indigestion for years, and uh, it's really affecting him. And so after we prayed for Cole for healing... He has been testing it out by eating just apparently terribly greasy foods. And for the glory of God. For the glory of God. <laughs> All right, Cole, how are you feeling over there? Feeling great. <laughs> feeling great. Give that guy a pizza, okay? So, so it, it was, is there anything else you wanted to no, say about that story? No, that's it. I mean, it's just because it's we can we can debate on whether this is weird all day, and there's a YouTube clip of someone making fun of Michael with a puke emoji. But but at the end of the day, someone was sick, and they're not now. Yeah. Right. Well, and Acts 10 and 11, and Cornelius sees. I mean, how would you feel? You, you're eating your your sandwich one day, and then down from heaven comes this sheet with all these animals and. You know, good old Peter, blanket. kill and eat. And I'm just imagining this barnyard scene, like, <laughs> and like all this. It's a little weird. A little weird. Just so. think about Jesus making mud balls with his spit and putting yeah. it on somebody's eyes. That's and weird. then, you know, there's another passage. He doesn't use mud. He just spits in a guy's eye. 
He did. Yeah. He spit in a blind man's eye and healed him. Now, I'm not recommending you do that. <laughs> but, but, you know, you take classes at seminary on hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. And one of the principles, we never found it, did we? Never taught it. This is that the principle of weirdness has never been a criterion for determining whether something is yeah. true or not. Because if you rule out weirdness, mm. you're going to rule out a whole lot yeah. in to, this to Bible. To steal an illustration from one of Matt's sermons, we, we believe that a virgin gave birth to the Son of God, yeah. floated into heaven, and is coming down on a white horse to judge the living and the dead. Yeah. We've already drunk the Kool-Aid. Let's just go all in with this, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like, point. there's nothing that gets weirder than white horses floating out of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, something that, uh, that Jack spoke into a moment ago, Jack, you talked about uh, you have to have space to fail. And I can imagine somebody out here that's thinking, yeah, you know, you, you try to share the gospel, so in evangelism, you fail, and somebody doesn't get saved, and everybody just moves along. But prophecy, to speak the word of the Lord, and to misrepresent him potentially, potentially how do we make space for faith? failing at prophecy, uh, and how do we defend that biblically? So, Jack or whomever wishes to, it's like a game of 500. You ever play that with the football? You just throw it up. Whoever wants to, just go for it's it. called it jackpot. Jackpot. Well, well, certainly it's easier to do what Jack said, do it in the home group. I mean, that just, that's space to fail. Mm-hmm. So it's just a lot easier. Yeah, I think don't train on Sunday morning. Yeah, don't, don't train on right. Sunday morning. But Sunday biblically, morning. theologically, how, how can we defend that prophecy can be missed? Agabus. Agabus. Do you want to explore that a little bit? So Agabus, well, I mean, I, I mean, I knew the text, but it was Sam's book that kind of brought it to my attention. Sam, do you want to unpack <laughs> yeah. the prophecy of... Yeah. Because uh, you'll be like, that sounds familiar. In, a- <laughs> in Acts 19 yeah. and in Acts 20, Paul twice says explicitly, I am constrained by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And he tells me that when I go, I'm going to get the tar beat out of me persecuted. All right, Paul knows. This is the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit spoke to him, constrained by the Spirit. So on their missionary journeys, he comes to Tyre, T-Y-R-E, not T-I-R-E, to Tyre, and the disciples there say, through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. And then Philip's four daughters, who were prophetesses, um, they basically chimed in. And then Agabus comes along, who's a recognized prophet, and he says, um, here's what I see happening to you. And he talks about how, how he's going to be bound and how he's going to be beaten and the Jews are going to try to kill him and, or carry him off. And uh, Paul says, you all are breaking my heart. He says, I know the Spirit of God's told me I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. So, and of course, when he goes, the things that happen there are not identical with even what Agabus saw in his vision. So what happened? I think what happened is very simple. I think... Um, the disciples at Tyre, Philip's four daughters, and Agabus probably had a vision of some sort, maybe a dream where they saw Paul being beaten, being persecuted, being tied up and bound and carried off. That was the revelation, and they were spot on. That's ex- that's ex- God doesn't make mistakes. The revelation's always inerrant. But then they interpreted that to mean he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. This is a warning that he should not go there because this is going to happen. Then they applied it by saying, Paul, don't go. Well, the revelation was right. The interpretation, the application were misguided and off base. So I, that's why in prophecy, all three elements are always there. Pe- people accuse us, and you all even did a program on this. They say that we believe that God misspeaks or that God reveals things that are false. And of course, we don't believe that at all. But if we opened up the Bible to a certain passage right now, and I could pick one, and there are six of us on the platform, we might have six different interpretations of that text. We think, wait a minute, the inspired, inerrant, fallible Word of God is right before us. I can read it in black and white, and yet five of us are probably wrong, maybe all six, <laughs> and, and yet we don't throw out the gift of teaching and say, well, well, if it's... If you're going to miss it, we've got to reject the gift of teaching because we, we can't have misinterpretations of divine revelation. We do that all the time. That's why we have Bible studies and classes and we read books. So why do we treat prophecy so different? God reveals something infallibly true. 
we misunderstand it, we misspeak it, we convey it incorrectly, we apply it incorrectly. So how did I get off on all that? I just started preaching this. Agabus, the Agabus you're answering the question. Oh, missing prophecies. Yeah. And, and anything else, Sam, that you would add on the how would you defend prophecies can be missed in such a way that it doesn't make you a false prophet that needs to be cast out of the well, church? Well, one reason is because as best I can tell, the language of false prophet is always used of unbelievers, non-Christians who deny the incarnation of Christ, deny the deity of Jesus. Um, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament that a Christian in a church who prophesies and might miss it is ever called a false prophet. All of us prophesy falsely. That doesn't make you a false prophet. So we need to watch our language there. Or we teach wrong things. I mean, just yeah. think about when you first started False teaching teacher. some of the things you... I taught. have repented so many times from doctrines that I used to teach that are on tapes, went around the world, and I don't believe that anymore. I've said, I'm sorry, I missed it. Well, yeah. people didn't excommunicate me. They didn't bring stones to church, you know, and have a public execution in the front of the, of the pulpit. So, yeah, we, we misinterpret, misapply something that's objectively there, how much more possibility is there that when some sub, something subjectively comes and we try to process it and interpret it and apply it, yeah, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. But that Paul says, I know you're going to miss it. Don't despise it. Yeah. To despise okay. it is sin. That's good. Yeah. Okay, Matt, uh, toward the beginning of the program, you mentioned uh, about red flags, and you said that uh, that there just tend to be a handful of red flags that people bring up every time I talk about this subject. Sure. I wonder if you could choose maybe one of them to speak yeah. into. What's, what's maybe the biggest red flag that, that, and how you've responded well, to it? Well, and this might create quite a bit of conversation up here because I'm not sure how this will land. But hmm. like the biggest concern is you're going to have to do something with Bethel in 20, 21, 22, 23, 20, that they are, because of their music, they are, when you start talking about the gifts, the person that's just listening to Christian radio and loves Bethel music and heard that a woman with Gandalf's staff cast racism off of America and then they lay on graves and suck the anointing out of graves and they, like, is that where we're going? Can, can I unpack some of those stories just briefly so that we, we fairly represent Bethel? Um, so, so with, the, with the, the Cheyon, that was an event that, that uh, Bill Johnson was at. Okay. That wasn't a Bethel event necessarily. And, and the, the, the grave soaking thing has been addressed. We don't do this here. We don't want to do this here. It did happen. And it definitely happened with their leadership. So it's not like it just happened. It was like his wife was there. Okay. So but, I, I want to I yeah. be fair on both sides. You're sure. very right. Yeah, that they stuff subsequently is repudiated that and, yes. and right. distanced but, themselves from it. But to your point, so, when someone's yes. looking into Bethel, those issues arise. 100%. Right. And, and they will naturally be asking, is that where we're headed? Yes. Or so to do one that I, I probably, I, I've heard those from our people, but also the big one that there is a ton of evidence for. And, and I would say it, they might backtrack, but, but it's, it's forever in print and forever, which is an unfortunate 100%. part of being in leadership is the idea that, um, that God will heal if there's the faith of people around that person, believe with all their heart, the person will be feel, healed. I mean, we had a church plant that had, was nearly blown to pieces by some core people that read this book, handed this book out, believed this, had multiple special needs children born to them, and then ostracized anyone who wouldn't just say, the Spirit will heal those kids. And, I mean, it, it was ugly fast. And so, again, I don't want to get off on all that as much as just use that as an example of Bethel's, the force of Bethel's presence. Um, means that when you start talking about these things, that's what comes into people's heads or something they read about that Bethel does. Or, and, and so I have found that that's in TBC. That's the red flag that people raise all the time. Wait, are we, are we heading this way? Uh, to which then I'm going to ask the follow-up question of what exactly do you mean? Um, it's too broad of a thing. Like you're talking about Bethel. So tell me what you mean by that. And, and then we can address those kinds of things. I mean, questions. if you just say, hey, we're going to be like Bethel, we're going to go out into the city and find sick people and pray for them and talk to them about Jesus, 
Yes. yes. And that way we're going to be like that's right. Please. But at Gandalf staff, that's there's the line, right? Yeah, no. There's our line. <laughs> None shall pass. Never mind. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> that line. You shall not Sorry. pass. <laughs> okay. I love it. Uh, I, I love the way that there was a little bit of tension we had to break up there. So. I, but I love the way that you address it with nuance, sure. and I think that's so key for Christian leaders. Yeah. And in this space that we're trying to occupy of word and spirit, everyone's always trying to get Christian leaders to castigate this group or castigate that group. And sometimes somebody needs to be castigated, for lack of a better sure. Some Sometimes someone needs to be called out on something, but we do have to be able to speak with nuance, and so I think that's really important. Uh, But the issue has been raised on Bethel. Uh, I wonder how other Christian leaders either have handled that or would handle when the Bethel question comes up in a congregation, how would you handle it? I'll, I'll say two quick things. First of all, I'm not disagreeing with what Mattis said. Let's not forget these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not talking about whether they're saved. I know they love Jesus. They do. Their songs preach penal substitutionary atonement. Um, You all sang King of Kings twice last night. That came out of Hillsong. Hillsong's not all that much different from Bethel in so many respects. I wrote an article, a long article in the blog um, just a couple weeks ago called In Defense of Singing Songs from Bethel and Hillsong because a lady had come out and said, we're not going to sing those songs yeah. in our churches. You've been singing them here. You didn't, probably didn't know it. Living Hope, King of Kings, there's so many others. Um, so I just want to say um, I, I disagree with a lot of things that they do there, but I also want to embrace them as brothers and sisters sure. in Jesus Amen. and pray for them. Um, so let's keep that, yeah. that balance. So other comments, go ahead. Jeff, Jack, y'all have any thoughts? No. So we, we've done tons of content on Remnant on that, and we are, we're in that same place where we want to call balls and strikes. We're going to say that we like, that we don't, that we like, that we don't. And, and on the Bethel subject, we've actually, buddies here, our buddy Elijah, who actually came, taught, uh, oh, I see you back there. There you are. He released a phenomenal documentary that you all have to go watch called Sin Proof. Go check that out. That's good. Um, but that's neither here nor there. We, we've addressed a lot of these things and talked them out. Um, if you, if you want a space to kind yeah, of process Yeah, a great ar- article uh, was written by Andrew Wilson uh, that, you, that you can look up. He's I think great. it's called Don't Throw Out the Baby with the Bethel Water. It's called <laughs> Be- Beth- Bethel and the Bath Water, I think is what it's called. So. It, it's some pun yeah. on that yeah. expression. So uh, you can Google it, look it up. I think he gives a fair treatment. Okay, um, uh, so, so red flag, Jeff, do you have any of those same things? I think it, it should be helpful to follow up. Like, what is the concern from people who are like, hey, too fast, or uh, I'm not comfortable with where we're going here because of X, Y, and Z? What are the, their red flags? Well, just a tad more broadly, uh, e- exactly true that some folks are going to want us to move faster than I'm going to want us to move, and yeah. some slower, so I, I realize that, and that's going to happen. And um, I think... Uh, you know, just a, a big red flag would be just probably the people's past that came from a charismatic background that's that they didn't one. like. It's a huge one. And it wasn't a positive experience. And is this going to happen here? Yeah. So that's just one. Okay. Well, well, maybe on that. And uh, so, Jack, maybe I'll ask you. I know you've had you, you've dealt with this a lot. So, uh, given the number of people who've been hurt by abusive, uh, abusive charismatic churches where the gifts have, have gone crazy, maybe even where ecclesiological structures are set up, having apostles who are operating in abusive capacities. And as you've dealt with charismatic abuses over the years, what would be your advice, one, for any church member who's experienced that, and two, for any pastor who wants to make sure that doesn't happen in their church and wants to make a space for those people? Yeah. I don't think there's any way you can prevent abuses in the church. I think there, because the church is made up of people like us, yeah. we are we are going to abuse. We can correct abuses, though, and we can do it gently. Um, and I've been guilty of uh, of abuses. I, I mean, you know, I, I led a church and said, God only speaks through this word right here. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm condemning everybody that gets an impression or a dream and thinks God's uh, speaking. Um, but, but God has, he can correct those abuses, yeah. and so can we, just gentle, yeah. kind. Uh, I, probably for me, the, like the number one abuse I see in the charismatic ch- uh, church is telling everybody, that is saying that everybody can speak in tongues. The scripture says all don't speak in tongues, do they? 
So the, the answer to the charismatic answer to that is, well, he means the public use of tongues. Uh, and not everybody has the public gift of tongues, but there's a private gift that everybody has. Well, there's a little bit of evidence for that in the, in the Bible. Uh, but, but you don't build a doctrine on what something may mean, only on what it means for sure. And he's got a statement in there that is crystal clear. Not everybody speaks in tongues. So we say, uh, so some of my friends go, oh, no, everybody can speak in devotional tongues. And if you do, you're going to have more power to love. Uh, your prayers are going to be more powerful, etc. So we, we, build this, we build two classes, the, the really spiritual class that speaks in tongues and the, the other class that, that doesn't. I think that's an abuse, and I, I don't think it's good uh, mm. teaching, and I, and I end up correcting that everywhere I go. Mm. Good. Let's, let's start with Jeff, and then I want to come this way. Give, give a closing thought. That's like your group of pastors that are walking away and you want them to think about, meditate on X. Um, and I know, Matt, you've got to catch a plane, so if you've got a head. I'm good. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, just what's that, what's that closing thought you want people to meditate on as they're walking out of the well, session? I don't know. Maybe the first thought that comes to my mind is this. Um, you know, we're very excited and intentional about pursuing the gifts. Yes. But that's not going to be the main thing at Wood's Edge. Yeah. It's going to be loving Jesus. That's it. And so Amen. we'll Amen. keep that. So I, I think the best gift you could give to your church, your elder team, your, you know, your environment of influence is your heart fully alive in Jesus hmm. and to give yourself over to the cultivation hmm. of your own heart, awakened and quickened to the things of God, um, where, where, where if you'll give yourself to that end, then hmm. you'll, you'll be ready for the highs and lows of the other journeys that we're on on this, right? Um, and so you could go up all hopped up for your church, um, and, and I would ask you to breathe a little bit, cultivate a heart that's fully alive in Jesus, mm -hmm. awakened to hearing his voice, um, and then let the overflow of that be what helps you start to lead in the context that you're in. Yeah, John 15, 15, uh, which I'm saying the same thing both these guys said, but uh, John 15, 15, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And uh, I knew that was in the Bible for a long time before it meant anything to me. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Friends are friends for, for one reason, for the pleasure they have in each other's company. Yeah. Our best friend is the person who gives us the most pleasure. It's the one we enjoy the most. The friendship is never about service, although we'll serve our best friend in a heartbeat if our best friend needs it. So making friendship with God the, the main thing, enjoying him and feeling his pleasure in us. I pray for that every single day. Amen. Um, I would say this, a quick reminder, and I'll talk more about it tonight. God is not nearly as freaked out by our mistakes as you and I are. Sure. Hmm. We get so nervous, like lightning bolts are going to come out of heaven because somebody hmm. missed a prophetic That's word good. or a word of knowledge or hmm. we didn't pray and see the kind of success we wanted or somebody screams out in a meeting and we, we're, we're freaked. Hmm. God loves his children. He right. knows we're goofy. He knows we're weak and broken. <laughs> He's not freaked out. He's hmm. not wringing his hands and pacing the courts of heaven and saying, what am I going to do with you? Now, you do something like Ananias and Sapphira, he'll drop you dead on the spot, right? But we're not, <laughs> there is that. There is but, that. <laughs> but we're not talking about that. So I would just say... Just <laughs> dial it down and and know that Good. That, that the he Lord will kill you. The, but he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> he is incredibly patient with us, and so maybe we should be incredibly patient with one another in these That's regards. Good. That's good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I I would say w when we're approaching the gifts, there is a danger on both sides of the road, and I think. We tend to get concerned about just one side of the road. Yeah. On one side, it's uh, the abuse of the gifts, and on the other, uh, and on the other side, it's the neglect of the gifts. Yeah, and they're both real danger. And uh, on one side, it's gullibility, and you believe everything and all in on everything, charismania. And on the other side, it's skepticism. Yeah. And in the middle, that road that goes right in the middle of it is called discernment. And as the it people is. of God, we're called to walk in discernment, and that's where I would say 
what Jack was talking about, friendship with God comes into play. Yep. God is on the road in the middle. He's not joining the, the craziness on one side and the arms crossed skeptics on the other. He's, he's right in the middle, and there actually is a space in the middle. We call it word and spirit sometimes, uh, but discernment, just walking in discernment. That's right. Yeah, guys, I just say that um, the Holy Spirit's not dangerous. That's right. The gifts of the Spirit are not a threat. It's actually his promise to build up the church, right? Like, I'm going to edify, build up, equip. We shouldn't look at the gifts as a liability. They're a gift that God has given to bless you and to bless the people you lead. So don't look at them as a threat. Have a, beautiful, have a big, sovereign view of God and a very accurate view of man's anthropology. We're broken people. Broken people do broken things. And we can pastor that. That's, that's their jobs. That's what we do. Just carry that same context of, I'm going to start home groups, and someone's going to say something wacky at home groups, and I'm going to pastor that. There's going to be things, that same category, move that over to prophecy. Hmm. It's not dangerous. We can do this, okay? Let's pray. Yeah. I think that'd be the right spiritual wrapping paper. Um, Jack, you want to pray for us? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hmm. Father, thank you so much that when we cared nothing about you, you cared about us, and you... Uh, revealed yourself to us and you uh, caused us to be born again and now we have a home in heaven thank you lord that uh, you want to be our friend that you want to talk with us you want to spend time with us and thank you for uh, the voice of your spirit and pray that we may hear it better and i pray for all of us uh, that you would grant to us uh, to be one of your best friends and put it on our heart every day uh, to ask you to feel your affection that day and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor is ourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.